Hi, it's Dr. Ray here, and I'm here to give you the short story uh, on the intersex and the differences between sex and gender today that we're going to talk about um, this more in uh, class in our CBL. And so here you can see I, I, I uh, sort of targeted some lecture objectives for this short movie. Um, and you can see uh, you have this slide in the PowerPoint as well. So we're going to talk about the difference between sex and gender. We're talk, talking about intersex, talk about what it means to be transgender, um, and ambiguous genitalia. So essentially, um, you know, we don't talk too much uh, in anatomy about uh, uh, different aspects of patients that where anatomy is more applied. Um, but here, uh, in when we talk about the pelvis and reproductive organs, uh, it actually is very appropriate to uh, bring up the difference between sex. Uh, and usually, when uh, in anatomy we talk about sex, we're just talking about male or female anatomy and parts that are um, have developed and are present. In our society, we talk about gender a lot. Um, as a social construct. So what does it mean to be male or female? And this is not always tied to an individual's sex or anatomic parts. And so one of the thing, uh, things that I'd like to bring up today and, and, we, and hopefully start you along this uh, process is this idea of male and female. Certainly we can, we can uh, talk about uh, uh, parts and anatomic parts and someone um, presents to us in a clinic, um, but then also we have to take into account the patient's uh, gender uh, in the way that they um, uh, see themselves and identify because this is a very important part of someone's life and you have to be able to connect with your patients and understand uh, the position and where they're coming from and the things that are important to them. So we want to separate these two things but make them come together when you're actually practicing with patients. So you, you might uh, not have considered this um, idea before but we only have uh, two categories oftentimes when you have uh, someone ask for sex, uh, male or female. But why do we only have two categories? Because just like in other places of development, we know that we're going to have variations of development. And so if these lines are changed or blurred, ha we have to have a category for individuals uh, to put down uh, something other than male or female. And actually, this is not anything that is new in other societies. They have a third sex. Uh, and it has, they have had third sexes for a, for a long time and they recognize individuals in their societies. This is one example from South Asia. And then this is another example from Native American culture. You can see that uh, they have an entire uh, third sex and, and these individuals are actually um, honored in their society as deities, uh, almost deities, and they have special places uh, within their culture. And so, um, we should think about what about a third sex uh, for for our culture, and is it uh, is it really necessary? So I would argue that yes, it is necessary to have a third sex because we have physical bodies that um, are present to us and are born um, that that actually don't fit into this male or female uh, gender dichotomy, and so. One of the, the uh, things that are important from a clinical standpoint is should we change our you know, gender or sex ca uh, categories to incorporate a third sex or should we try to change the body when we're presented with a newborn that has anatomy that doesn't fit into one of these two categories. So this is a really an argument or a discussion that has been happening for a long time and I don't know, everyone might have a personal feeling about where they stand with it. The Washington Post published this article a couple years ago about a third sex called intersex. So uh, this is um, an actual sex category for individuals uh, that are in intersexual. So if that this means that they have anatomic variations that either involve internal genitalia or external genitalia, sometimes both. And so uh, a very interesting article, and I think that's uh, very timely, and it's something that we should push forward with and, and understand and talk about because uh, we, do not, we do not have uh, only two categories of sex in our culture as well. And then I wanted to bring up this idea because I think uh, 
if, if you if this information is new to you, then you might be wondering about, well, what how does this compare with other categories that we talk about? Um, and for example, if someone is transgender or transsexual, and how does that differ from someone who is intersex? So I just wanna point out this big difference. If someone is uh, transgender or transsexual, essentially they are, they're born usually with typical male or female anatomy, so they, they, they would fit into one of those categories, but they don't feel like they were born into that sex um, it, that doesn't feel like it matches them. And so it's, it's an internal uh, feeling and an internal discussion that they have and, and um, it's something that happens uh, within someone. If someone ha has an intersex condition, they're usually told by practitioners or other people that they don't have anatomy that's typical to the rest of the population. And so it's a very, it's a much more of an external situation that occurs that then affects the person internally. And here's just one example of a famous um, transgender person. All right, and so here uh, we see another personal story. I like to look on YouTube um, and to learn more about the feelings that individuals have um, really when they kind of go through all different types of conditions and different types of transformations in their life. And one of them um, that I found to be extremely helpful on, on YouTube was to follow individuals as they go through a transformation of being one gender to another. So this is an example of, of an um, individual that I found on YouTube and I really enjoyed you know, hearing her story um, and her personal feelings. And so uh, just reiterating that that is the main difference between someone who is transgender or transsexual and internal um, transformation and internal feeling that then they express to others versus uh, being uh, intersex where someone is noticing that your gender, uh, I mean, excuse me, that your um, genitalia is not a typical presentation of a male or female genitalia. Okay, so you might be wondering how common is intersex? So essentially when you look at the frequency, um, it, it gets a little bit more muddled because there are a lots of different conditions that may or may not fall into this umbrella term intersex. Okay, so well maybe we should just account, you know, only if the sex chromosome is different from uh, what, it, what it typically is. Maybe that counts as intersex. Well, maybe we should count other anatomic variations if someone has a smaller penis than typical or if they have a large clitoris compared to the typical size. Maybe we should count those individuals. Maybe we should count individuals that have different types of phenotypes so their actual body just isn't shaped like typical male or female. Um, and then also some individuals undergo surgery to try to normalize their genitals should we count those individuals as still being intersex? So I think that you could uh, understand when you, talking about these main points that there really isn't any agreement on what counts as intersex. And so that's what makes it difficult to um, come up with the, the prevalence. However, when, when you look at the list and what the, the estimation is just generally, because you have to somehow make it, make some sort of investigation into it, it's about as typical as uh, Down syndrome. And certainly you could think of how many times do we talk about Down syndrome uh, throughout your medical curriculum, but we don't really talk about intersex that much. And that's why I'm bringing it up to you today. All right, and then uh, the, this other point. So how should, clinicians react to a newborn that is uh, born with different uh, genitalia compared to the typical male or female genitalia. And so there's a lot of discussion, there has been a lot of discussion about this for hundreds of years. Um, one of the, the possibilities is to uh, undergo surgery to normalize a genitalia. Um, the, uh, the good things about that is that maybe that would help that individual sort of be reared or grow up in um, what they feel like is fitting in and being more like everyone around them. Um, the hard part about undergoing surgery is that it's not reversible. So if that individual had normalizing surgery, but then changes their mind and wants to uh, go in a different direction or identify with a different sex category, you know, it might be very difficult to do that um, if they've already undergone surgery or maybe already removed tissues that they wanted to keep. Um, and it, and it, affects, it affects the physical body. So it's certainly making um, physical changes that we can't really easily change back. Now, if instead of undergoing surgery, what we do is look at all the data that we have and then make a gender assignment, the good news about that is that it's reversible. 
Um, and um, it's really more giving that person a social role that they can change later on. It doesn't mean that this is necessarily um, easier, but it is certainly um, easier to change later if the individual decides that they want to um, identify with a different sex or make any changes. And so um, here I, I in included this uh, video where uh, there are some clinicians um, and talking uh, to you about uh, their their view and what how they feel about um, treating intersex patients. So I really liked this; it's a really good video. And so I had the link in the PowerPoint. And I think that one of the things that that everyone can agree on is that if you help individuals who are intersex who feel alone and they feel isolated to find a support network, that is the most important thing that you can do as a clinician. Even if the person is undecided on what they they want to do with their their social roles, what they want to do with their physical body, the best thing you can do is help them feel like they are not alone. And so I think that no matter what area you practice in, I think that that is something you should keep in mind. Like, do we have a social support network in our city for patients that come to you that fit this category? So um, I, I think that this is debatable. So I'll tell you that this is a gray area, uh, but generally speaking, um, uh, I think most of the organizations agree that after birth, if you have um, a newborn, that's really there's a question mark on whether or not there should be a gender or sex assignment to the individual. That we really should do more diagnostic tests. Let's let's see, get all of the information to see um, what that individual patient. Uh, situation is. So no two people are together. And then certainly any medical procedures that have to be performed, like if the individual is missing in a, a urethra then, then uh, or external urethral orifice, we need to perform that surgery and then maybe, maybe not do any normalizing genital surgery until the individual is mature enough um, and old enough to make the decision on their own and give consent. So here you can see, like I mentioned, there, there's a long list of the spectrum of intersex conditions. So all of, if you wanna go on this website and you can see that um, there are um, a lot of different individuals that fit into this category. Um, and then I sort of um, just summarize basically any variation in chromosomes, gonads, internal, external genitalia, or phenotype, body type that's not typically male or female, can follow under this spectrum. So um, one of the terms that we use and clinical, clinic, clinicians use is um, to describe genitalia that really it doesn't fit into a typical category is we may say that the genitalia is ambiguous, which means the, uh, it doesn't mean that there isn't genitalia, but it means that it's not easy to put that genitalia into one category or the other. So you can see three examples of that here. So it's just not typical um, um, external genitalia. And I do want to point out because I, you know, spent a, spent a lot of time um, looking at this material and researching it that we have vari variations in everybody's genitalia, and so um, I think that one of the uh, difficult things about studying this area and as an anatomist is that they always depict, you know, one kind of what uh, they consider a typical penis and a typical pudendum of the female, but certainly there there is a wide variation in what this area looks like anatomically. And so th this can be a very um, uh, psychologically hurtful um, area if, if comments are ever made to patients, even in their private lives or if they're in a clinic um, and comments are made about their genitalia being, you know, too big or too small or um, uh, just different. And so I think you should be mindful of this when you're talking about your patient's um, external genitalia. And then I also want to say that not, it's not only the size and shape of genitalia that causes uh, people psychological distress, but also the function of genitalia. And I put a couple little articles in here where you can see, like, for example, men are concerned with the amount of time they can hold an erection or and also like premature ejaculation. And women are concerned with the amount of fluid and type of fluid that they may release at orgasm. And so th there are certainly um, categories that you might want to become more knowledgeable in because you're your patients may ask you about these things and you certainly don't want to dismiss their inquiries. One of the uh, classic also cases I think that's talked about in development is a condition called clitoromegaly. Um, I think that you know this is the typical uh, 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 presentation 
of the pudendal region of the female, but some females um, end up having an enlarged clitoris. Sometimes it, it is also um, associated with other things like fused labia, but this isn't always the case. It can sometimes just be a um, uh, anomaly all in, on its own, essentially. And I'm gonna show you a picture of this uh, right here. This is, this is one um, presentation of clitoromegaly where it's just an enlarged clitoris. The, the labia are not fused. Uh, and, and when you're looking here posteriorly. And so um, this individual may consider themselves intersex or they may not, and this just might be an anatomic variation for them. Another common um, uh, variation in gen, actually I, I misspoke, it is not common, this is very, very uncommon, is aphalia, although it is in your textbook, and essentially it's, it's the absence of a penis to develop at all, very uncommon. Um, and so you can see that this individual, this would be an issue if there's no external urethral orifice that would need to be fixed right away so that person could uh, urinate. And then I do want to point out that we did have an old taxonomy for intersex individuals. And essentially, it, it just um, uh, focused on the presence of either ovarian tissue or testicular tissue. And it, it was very confusing, and it was a derogatory terminology or taxonomy where they um, called individuals hermaphrodites or pseudo-hermaphrodites according to whether or not they had just one type of gonadal tissue or they had two. And so it was, it was very difficult to really have individualized understanding of every person and the type of internal external genitalia and that person's um, also um, a feeling of fitting into a particular sex category. And so it really was no clinical help and it was derogatory. So this kind of taxonomy has been abandoned. And so actually now, um, you know, clinicians recognize that we could have variations in the chromosomes, in the phenotype, internal genitalia, and external genitalia. And this is really the complete picture of an individual um, that an individual's sort of sex and sex um, uh, assignment and their se and their um, uh, really how they fit into a particular um, diagnosis that you can talk to with other clinicians and. Not everybody really likes this term because it still sort of uh, stigmatizes individuals of feeling like they have a disorder. But I, even the association um, for the Intersex Association agrees that it is important for clinicians to be able to talk to each other and, and generally explain that if there is a variation here, that that can fit under a disorder of sexual development. So it is considered a, an appropriate and acceptable term for clinicians to use. But I want to mention that you it's not necessarily a term that you want to tell patients that they have a disorder because of the fact that they that might be very hurtful to them. So you should um, you know talk to a patient about how they feel about uh, their bodies and how they feel about themselves before you use terminology that uh, they may not agree with. And so that's it. So I just wanted to bring up this very important topic and then uh, we're gonna continue and do some cases today in class, thank you.